morning and welcome to worship on this Pentecost Sunday. What a privilege it is to gather together as we do. Let's turn our hearts and our minds heavenwards. You know, the disciples, as they met that 50th day after Passover, they did not know what to expect. They gathered and they prayed. And the Lord showed up in a very big way. So we are expecting that today because we are gathered in his name. So you hear from the, the, the book of Acts, second chapter. I'm going to read verses 1 to 4 and then to 14 to 21. When the day of Pentecost had come, they were all together in one place. And suddenly there came from heaven a noise like a violent rushing wind. And it filled the whole house where they were sitting. And there appeared to them tongues as a fire distributing themselves, and they rested on each one of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with other tongues, as the Spirit was giving them utterance. But Peter, taking his stand with the eleven, raised his voice and declared to them, Men of Judea and all you who live in Jerusalem, let this be known to you, and give heed to my words. For these men are not drunk, as you suppose. For it is only the third hour of the day. But this is what was spoken of through the prophet Joel. And it shall be in the last days, God says, that I will pour forth my spirit on all mankind. And your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. And your young men shall see visions. And your old men shall dream dreams. Even on my bond slaves, both men and women, I will in those days pour forth my spirit and they shall prophesy. And I will grant wonders in the sky above and signs on the earth below, blood and fire and vapor of smoke. The sun will be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before the great and glorious day of the Lord shall come. And it shall be that everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Amen indeed. Let's sing together. Rise up, O men of God. Hymn 400. Standing together, let's sing. this community. Would you take a minute just to look around the room and just wave at one another. We are so grateful that you're with us today. If you're joining us by television or on live stream, God bless you. We've prayed for you. We are so thankful to worship with you at home today. Welcome to worship. Amen. 
Welcome to the First Baptist Church of San Antonio. We're grateful that you can worship with us today. If you are in the room or with, your, with us on KSAT 12 today, uh, we're grateful. And we know that our God has been good. Today is day 437 of this pandemic for us. This is Sunday number 63. And as we come to Sunday number 63, this is a day of celebration. And we know this is a day of celebration because we look back over the last 437 days and there have been some markers that were important. One of those important markers was exactly one year ago, Pentecost 2020, we came back to in-person worship. If you remember, there was a time, uh, a couple of months, a few months, where uh, we were all worshiping virtually. Um, Aaron and I were here uh, leading an empty room. And we missed you. Uh, Those days were gut-wrenching. But then, Pentecost 2020, we knew by the wisdom and guidance of our Lord that we needed to bring back in-person worship. And so we did, though it was restricted in a number of different ways. Uh, We were able, with those qualifications, to maintain in-person worship for now one year. And you know, what we need to celebrate together, and, and I say this with glory unto the Lord... That we recognize we have been in person worship, though with restrictions, for one year now. And to our knowledge, there has not been a single case of coronavirus in our worship services. Can we thank the Lord for that? You see, we, we have done our best to be wise as we have approached these things. We've tried to consider any and all factors that we needed to consider. We tried to consult all of those that we needed to consult, and we were doing our best to be wise in that. But our number one place we went for wisdom was the Lord our God. And He has blessed those efforts, and we are grateful for that. You know, we recognize that we've been able to have in-person worship for a year without incident, and that is a miracle. And so we say, bless the Lord. Praise the Lord for that miracle. Because it is not of our hands that this has happened. But God has been gracious to us. And we recognize through this this last year, from Pentecost to Pentecost, that we've still been able to do wonderful ministry for the sake of the Lord, even during the height of the pandemic. As as numbers were, were surging here before, we were able to do great ministry. Now, most of that was was, um, locally. We were able to serve families with food. We were able to serve hundreds uh, of families a week, uh, uh, different meals. Yesterday, we were able to serve the homeless and low income in our neighborhood. We had a health fair. We had 25 agencies here. Uh, We had over 150 volunteers, including those agencies here, and were able to serve the city well. And, And we praise the Lord for that. We still have those opportunities. Uh, We had to move it inside because it was raining, um, but God took care of us. Now, we've also seen that that through all of this, we've been able to maintain our mission work across the globe. We're we're still going on our mission trip to Jemez, New Mexico this summer. We were able to help plant a church in Brooklyn, New York uh, in the last year. And that church in Brooklyn has been meeting in a park. And they said in just in about two weeks, they're going to be doing baptisms at Coney Island. And so we're grateful for those that God's still been able to work and they've been preaching in the park and God has been doing mighty things. They've grown 60, 70, 80 folks uh, meeting at that, that church in Brooklyn. You know, we've been able to keep our, our relationships and ministry across the globe. We've, we've been able to do work in the Dominican Republic, Turkey, Thailand. We've been able to do work in Congo. I, I hope you know we've had a great relationship with a, a local Congolese congregation here in San Antonio that's connected to a specific church in the Congo. And just a couple of months ago, they they were able to come here to do their baptisms in this room where Congolese folks were baptized here and they were able to broadcast that back to the Congo and they were celebrate together uh, online in, in a beautiful time of worship. We've been able to serve in Brazil, Ukraine, Peru, Romania. We've had friends in Burma who have been fighting uh, or struggling with the, the military fight that's upon them and we've been able to serve them well in all of that. And so those missions have not stopped, even in the midst of the pandemic. And we're grateful for the local mission. We're grateful for the international mission to take the gospel to every corner of this globe. 
And we're grateful for that. And you know, at the same time as we celebrate that there has not been a single case in worship that, that we're aware of, we celebrate that. We also recognize that uh, brothers and sisters across the globe are still struggling. In fact, just a couple of weeks ago, I was on the phone, actually on Zoom, with some new friends in India. There's some friends that are uh, locals who are planting churches in India, and they were lamenting that they are at the height of it, and seeing church members pass away, um, seeing pain in the streets. Um, but, but they were rejoicing still. And one of the things they were rejoicing about is they said, uh, Pastor, there was uh, just a couple of weeks ago before, before I was on the Zoom with them, they said they had been witnessing to a, a couple. And uh, just that day we were on the Zoom, they said that uh, there were going to be uh, more restrictions coming because of the coronavirus sweeping through India. And they said that that couple had called earlier that day and said, we want to be baptized. And we want to be baptized before these new restrictions hit. Can you make it? They said they were rushing across the city that day to go baptize that couple before the next wave of restrictions hit. And we say that because we recognize that even through the worst of this, God has been good and God has been working and God is bringing salvation to all who call upon his name, no matter what's happening on the face of this earth. And so we, we praise him for that and we're grateful for that. And so today is our day of celebration in all of those things. Uh, we celebrate that today is Pentecost Sunday. This is the day we celebrate the Holy Spirit coming upon the church, being our power, our authority. Helps us to remember and to serve. And so we say thank you, Lord. So with those things, those things said, welcome to the First Baptist Church of San Antonio. Here we worship our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, and this time is for him. Let's pray. Lord, we recognize your spirit at work among us. Even through the worst of the pain of the pandemic, your spirit has been a deliverer. And so, Lord, we praise your name for that deliverance, for taking care of us, for watching over us. And, Lord, we have no idea what tomorrow holds, but we know to this date you have been a mighty God who has taken care of us every step of the way. And so, Lord, we say thank you. You have been our rock steady source of strength though this world is, is chaotic all about us and we pray saying that we're going to cling to our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ no matter what this world throws at us and so Father we come to this time to worship and to praise your holy name for your good and your loving kindness endures forever it's in the name of the Christ, Jesus, that we pray. Amen. Hear now from Second Timothy, the first chapter, verses 7 through 12. And let's gather strength as we continue to worship our Lord. For God has not given us a spirit of timidity, but of power and of love and discipline. Therefore, do not be ashamed of the testimony of our Lord or of me, his prisoner, but join with me in suffering for the gospel according to the power of God, who has saved us and called us with a holy calling, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace, which was granted to us in Christ Jesus from all eternity. But now has been revealed by the appearing of our Savior, Christ Jesus, who abolished death and brought life and immortality to light through the gospel, for which I was appointed a preacher and an apostle and a teacher. For this reason, I also suffer these things, but I am not ashamed. For I know whom I have believed, and I am convinced that he is able to guard that which I have entrusted to him until that day. What a great God we serve. Let's sing together, everyone. Come, Holy Spirit, and Pentecostal power as we stand together.
Amen. Children, if you would, come down here. I've got a box full of things for you to see. If you will come sit with me. Come on down. All right. I'm going to start. As you come down, as y'all come on down, I'm going to start setting some of these things around me. Come on down. There you go. You see these things here? I'm sitting around me. Okay, got some stuff. Yeah, come on down, come on down, come on down. Yeah, you see? see yeah. All right. Okay, you see? Yeah, come on down, come on down. Yeah, come on, come on. Yeah, all right. So you see all of these things around me? Do, do these things make sense? Do you see anything that would make you understand where these are, what these are doing? Yeah, any thoughts? No, I know they're they're kind of a random collection of things, aren't they? Do you, what do you think? The nail is for when Jesus got nailed to the cross. Ooh, that's good. We're, we're going to get to Jesus in a minute. You're pretty close because that's what that looks like, isn't it? Yeah, this looks like a nail that Jesus uh, would have been nailed to the cross with, and it's pretty close. But no, all of these things. So let me tell you about all these. All of these things are different gifts that people have given me through the years, and they have special meaning to me. So this one is a homemade knife, a man made for me, but that man has now passed away. Uh, this is a homemade angel, another lady made for me, but she has now passed away too, unfortunately. Uh, this is from Africa. Pastor Danny brought this back for me uh, after a mission trip. So that was from Pastor Danny. This is a book. This was a gift somebody gave me just this week. In fact, there's another pastor in town that that's uh, leaving and going to a new job. And we had lunch and he brought this gift for me because we were friends. And so he brought me that. Uh, this, this is just perfectly San Antonio. When we moved to San Antonio, a friend bought me this. They're Tim Duncan Cereos or, or Cheerios or something. <laughs> what does it say? Slam Duncanos. So that was, that was kind of a cool gift, right? And then this was, just, this was recently sent to me too by a friend. It's, it's a picture he says he thought of me. It says, exit, pursued by bear. And so it's just a picture of that. So I say that because all of these are really nice gifts that people have given me through the years. But every one of them reminds me of a moment. They remind me of a relationship. They remind me of friends. They remind me of the power of God. And so they're nice. I mean, the presents are nice, but... Really, it's about the stories behind the presence. And really, it's about what God was doing in all of these lives and all these relationships. And so that's kind of the important part. I want you to listen because today in the sermon, there's a couple of gifts that are given. That The king, King Solomon of one country, brings some gifts. And then a queen of another country brings some gifts. And they give gifts to one another. And they're very fancy and they're very expensive. And they mean a lot of different things. But what was more important than any of the gifts were the relationships that were formed. And the queen went away knowing more about God and, in fact, praising God. And hopefully, that's what we can leave all of our friends with, that when our friends come in contact with us or we send gifts or they send gifts to us, that they will know that this is about something more than a gift. It's about a relationship with a person and a relationship with God. And so would you listen carefully in the sermon for some of the gifts that they gave to one another and then also what that queen said about God before she left. Okay? Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for how you give good and perfect gifts from above. Lord, how you take care of us and you provide for us every day. And Lord, we pray that you would help us to understand and see clearly what a relationship with you means. And Lord, we pray that you would bring us all to a personal saving relationship with Jesus Christ. And it's in his name that we pray. Amen. Thank you all. I'm not sure I can think of a better evangelistic text than the text for And Can It Be, the hymn And Can It Be. Such a powerful testimony of what God can do. 
that all of us have, have, we are chained to sin in some way. And God and God alone can break through that and bring light and hope. So as we sing this today, I, I pray that you will sing your testimony. That you can say now, boldly I approach the eternal throne because of what God has done for you. Are you ready? Stand together, let's sing. If we're long today, friends, it's all my fault. I told Pastor this uh, this morning that we got a lot of music to sing, and I'm not even apologizing for it. Uh, 63 weeks, and we're back together. 
And the text of this song is exactly why. To love our God. The reason we live. Our highest call is to love our God.
in. We're going to read aloud together 2 Chronicles chapter 9, verses 1 through 8. You'll see it on top of your listening sheet. If you would find that and stand with me. This then is the text for today. Now when the queen of Sheba heard the fame of Solomon, she came to Jerusalem to test Solomon with difficult questions. She had a very large retinue with camels carrying spices and a large amount of gold and precious stones. And when she came to Solomon, she spoke with him about all that was on her heart. Solomon answered all her questions. Nothing was hidden from Solomon, which he did not explain to her. When the queen of Sheba had seen the wisdom of Solomon, the house which he had built, the food at his table, the seating of his servants, the attendance of his ministers and their attire, his cupbearers and their attire, and his stairway by which he went up to the house of the Lord, she was breathless. Then she said to the king, It was a true report which I heard in my own land about your words and your wisdom. Nevertheless, I did not believe their reports until I came and my eyes had seen it. And behold, half of the greatness of your wisdom was not told me. You surpassed the report that I had heard. How blessed are your men! How blessed are those whose servants who stand before you continually and hear your wisdom. Blessed be the Lord your God who delighted in you, setting you on his throne as king for the Lord your God, because your God loved Israel, establishing them forever. Therefore he made you king over them to do justice and righteousness. May God bless the reading of his word. When you make big waves in the world, people are going to wonder where they came from. Now, some will seek the origin of these waves with good intentions, hoping to find something productive. Others, though, are going to seek the origins of these waves with an intent to destroy. It really doesn't matter who or what is at the other end. They refuse discomfort or change. Now, the Queen of Sheba is the former She saw the tide of change rushing forth all around her kingdom. And like a good leader, she ventured out seeking the truth. She was over a kingdom that sat on the other end of the Red Sea from Israel. 1,400 miles south of Solomon's kingdom... But it's likely that as the queen of Sheba held strategic maritime trade routes, Solomon held strategic overland trade routes. And these were being buoyed by Solomon's naval operations that had been moving further into the south, the queen's territory. But as Solomon's naval and trade ships created waves in her trade corridors, the queen didn't lash out in vengeance. She traveled north at 1,400 miles with a horde of gifts, including their specialized frankincense and myrrh. You know, this is a reminder that sometimes we, we read these stories and we picture individuals. We picture Solomon. We picture this queen. But these two individuals represented something larger. They represented nations and peoples, both of which were, were large and doing much in the ancient world. And so these two, they represented two of the wealthiest nations of the day. And their interaction with all of these gifts are similar to France sending along the Statue of Liberty in 1886, or China sending us two giant pandas in 1972, or even the United States sending a statue of George Washington to the British in 1921. These are gifts that are meant to impress and appease an olive branch to another political power. And so the queen sets out on this journey, and she sets out with such gifts. And as the text states in verse 1 and also in verse 5, she heard many things about Solomon. She had heard many things about Israel, and the things that she had heard of Solomon and of Israel, they defied logic. 
And in her own wisdom as a leader, instead of fearing those rumors, she went forth to find the truth. Verse 1 says she had heard of Solomon's fame. Verse 5 says she had heard of his words and his wisdom. You know, when a rival is said to possess knowledge, you, you have to do what you have to do to go and get it one way or another. And so she did. And surely some of her inquiries of Solomon were around choke points of global trade. Something equivalent to, you know, what happens if a giant container ship blocks the Suez Canal in 3,000 years? Or, as the text goes, the, the Queen of Sheba seemingly asked Solomon all kinds of questions about ruling well. But it, but it goes much deeper than that. It goes beyond trade. It goes beyond ruling as a queen. In fact, verse 1 tells us that she asked him the most difficult questions of life, almost like riddles. The, the ancient language here points us to the word enigma in the original. She's asking him about the enigmas of life, the riddles of life. She wants to know about what is this life all about. You see, as the conversation goes, she doesn't just ask Solomon about the trade in Ophir. She wants to know about this life. What, what is this about? How, how do we get to where we are? And, you know, I imagine this, this conversation is something like an initial version of Ecclesiastes from Solomon. As he examines the, the purpose of life under a call of God. Now, we don't really know what Solomon told her. But we do have some of her responses. One of those is what we see in verse 7. Let me read that for you again. She says to him, How blessed are your men. How blessed are these your servants who stand before you continually, who get to hear your wisdom. And so she recognizes this grand wisdom of Solomon that God has given him. But, but don't forget, Solomon had it all. Not just the wisdom. Solomon had everything you would need to impress the most superficial people in this world. Whatever it was, Solomon had it. She experienced his acumen. She had already known his power nations away. But Solomon hits the trifecta here. He has the intellect, he has the power, and he has the luxury that's beyond anything that she had seen. You know, it's kind of a shame. But the reality is, for most of the people around us... That, that people are swayed by the superficial. You see, most of the world cares way too much about the price of your shoes or the rarity of your watch, the square footage of your home, or what flight from France the truffle flew in on. But as it was in Solomon's day, he held all of these cards, all of these kinds of things. And see, we see down in verse 3 that these shiny things that surrounded Solomon left the queen breathless. Even the things his attendants were wearing. You see, the food in the palace was exquisite. The waitstaff impeccable. Solomon has it all. If any one of us would have been in the queen of Sheba's shoes, our jaws would have dropped to the floor. And like her we would have wondered, how can it be? How can, how can all of this be so? How, how have you done this? What has happened? Because what the queen of Sheba was realizing, Solomon is not a facade. You know, many leaders through time have been able to slap gold plating on trash to feign impressibility. But not Solomon. He has a heart of gold. Solomon was more than toys and trade routes. He had a depth that could only come from God. In fact, she continues, if you move from verse 7 and look down at verse 8 with me, this is what the queen of Sheba is exclaiming before him. Blessed be the Lord your God who delighted in you, setting you on his throne as king for the Lord your God. Because your God loved Israel, establishing them forever. Therefore, he made you king over them to do justice and to do righteousness. Now, when we get to this verse in the text, when we get to verse 8, this seems completely out of place. Th this verse, verse 8, is surrounded by opulence. And in the middle of this impressive display of national wealth between countries, the Queen of Sheba acknowledges the Lord our God. She acknowledges the Creator of heaven and earth, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And as she is saying, how can this be? She looks up and says, it must be the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob that has done this. Now, I suspect 
Solomon must have been a witness. And this is what I mean. While answering all of her riddles, surely he must have told her of the Lord. See, we don't know if verse 8 came from Solomon or not, but, but it is the, the pivotal moment of truth in our reverse text this week. Because we have all seen, seen leaders who have claimed that spray paint was solid gold, and yet they get exposed in their folly. But, but even further, we, we, even beyond that, we, we, we see people whose lives revolve around the economy. And let me tell you, if your life revolves around the economic systems of this world, you are in for a terrifying ride. But when your life revolves around God, you will never be shaken. You see, in verse 8, we hear the truth. And, and we hear in verse 8, you see, you see, we know that the things that most often impress humanity, the, the toys, titles, attire, even, even a fertile mind. But, but all of these kinds of things, the flashy things, the shiny things, they cannot fix the complex problems of this life. And that's why she came to him. She said, you must know. What is the meaning of all of this? What, what makes this work? What is behind the scenes of this life? Would you tell me the truth? And Solomon tells her the truth of God. In fact, none of, the, none of the gifts, none of the stuff are going to fix the problems of life, but Lord God above can. You see, in fact, what we usually see is all of the things of this world and the things that we accumulate and the things that impress most people usually only prolong the pain. And what we see as she tells us what she tells us in verse 8, the queen of Sheba's eyes were opened to the truth of God. She saw through the sheen of Solomon's presence and realized that the spectacle is in heaven. I mean, she says it plainly here in verse 8. All of Israel is God's pleasure. And, and it's not because of Solomon. It's not because Solomon was a good leader. It's because the Lord God above blessed them and acknowledged them and held them up. You see, she, she, she recognized, she, she even says specifically here, Solomon, this is not your throne. This is a throne of God. And the throne that you sit on, it has an eternal purpose. You know what we recognize here? This should be encouraging to, to all of us on a number of different levels. First and foremost, we, first and foremost, we recognize that Solomon and his palace are both long gone. But you know, these days, that, that same God that the Queen of Sheba acknowledges here in verse 8 is the same God that's working still today, that's working in us this morning, that, that, is, that is moving us forward and, and, and is our perfect Redeemer and Deliverer. He's working in us. He's working on us. And it doesn't matter. And this is, what, this is one of the things that we can grab a hold of in this text. It doesn't matter how shiny and impressive you are because God is. All of those things that we need to be, God is. And what we recognize as this text unfolds, that it doesn't matter how shiny and impressive you are. Because we can, we can recognize together that, that life is not about finding a way to, to climb near the peaks of luxury that, that Solomon reached. Because we'll never get there. But life is about seeking the God who delighted in Solomon. Life is about chasing after this God who delights in all of his children and lifts them up and brings them into redemption. You see, what we, we see in this text is what the queen of Sheba was noticing in verse 8. The most impressive thing in all of Solomon's life wasn't the hoard of gold or the gifts he was going to give her. The most impressive thing in his life was the work of God. How God had been working in his heart. How God had been leading the nation of Israel towards righteousness and justice. So this is the most impressive thing I've seen. And in fact, the most impressive your life will ever be is when you are filled up with Jesus Christ. You, you will be at your best when people no longer see you, but they see the grace of God at work. 
You see, if, if your life is all about you, there, there's a problem. If all people ever see is whatever shininess you can muster up, it's going to fade quickly. But if your heart beats for Jesus Christ, you will leave the world breathless. You know, the world tells us that, that, that you need to find you. And the world tells us you need to find you and be you and promote you boldly. But Scripture tells us something very different. Scripture says that you take you and you crucify yourself with Jesus Christ so that you no longer live, but Christ lives in you. The Scripture teaches us that we get to a place, place where we are no longer on display, but the grace of God that shines brightly through us is what's on display for the world to see. You know, you can have a life of purpose and a life of clear direction. A life that's filled with meaningful work if only you will surrender to the Christ today. You see, what we recognize that's painted here for us as the, the queen comes to visit Solomon, the Lord holds every answer. This was not about the wisdom of Solomon. This was about the wisdom of God, the creator of the universe who knows the intricacies of how every minute of this life works. See, God knows it all, and Jesus Christ will answer every question. Now, we know that we may not like every answer that the Lord gives us, but you will find every answer that you need to find if you will seek the Lord this morning. You know, we recognize as we read this text, the Queen of Sheba is a lot like the Ethiopian in Acts chapter 8. They both come from afar, and, and they both recognize that there's something missing. They're, they're both recognizing there, there's something more to the Word of God. There's something more to life. There, there's something that I'm missing on this earth. And, and, and the answer is the same for, for all of us that have this sense that we're, we're missing something. Jesus Christ is the answer. See, for all of us who feel like there's something more, Jesus Christ said, here is the way. In fact, what we recognize, if we will surrender to the Christ, if we will give up our lives to Him, He will mold us into a saint of the kingdom of God. And in Christ, under the power of the Holy Spirit, we will be more impressive as a reflection of heaven than anything we could come up with on our own. In the Christ, we are saved. In the Christ, we are known. In the Christ, we are delivered. May we surrender our lives unto him this morning. Let's pray together. Lord, we recognize that you are a powerful, you're omnipotent, you're beautiful and graceful. Lord, you set creation in motion. And we come before you this morning, uh, this morning as servants of the living God. And Lord, we want to be obedient unto you. We want to chase after you. To sit and know the peace of your kingdom. Lord, we want to have purpose. The purpose of marching in step with the Lord. And so, Lord, we pray that you would come, that your spirit would descend on our hearts, spark something new within us. Bring us home, Father. It's in the name of our Lord and risen Savior, Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. We're going to have our time of response now, and like we do every week. And we pray that, that all of us would respond to the Lord in some way this morning, faithfully and obediently. There's some ways listed on the bottom of your listening sheet. Uh, the altar is open. If you want to come kneel and pray, you can come do that here. But also, I will be on this side. Pastor Brian will be over here. If you'd like to come forward and, and pray with one of us or speak with one of us about um, accepting Christ or, or being a part of this church, we, we, can, we can visit about that at this time. Um, maybe you need to pray where you are. However the Lord is leading you, be faithful, be obedient unto Him, and let's respond together.